thank you for joining the uh, People-Centered Internet Call here on the 16th of April. I'm delighted that you're with us. We have uh, Michael Becker with us as our guest today. He is the founder of Identity Praxis, and Identity Praxis is a uh, organization that he founded. He looks closely at privacy, identity, and the data that we uh, create as individuals, as teams, as organizations, and you know what the future might be of being able to uh, own and make use of the data that we create and throw off on, on a regular basis. So I have heard a version of this uh, presentation. It's really uh, quite insightful. And we're delighted to have Michael Becker with us today. And by the way, we wish him all the best as he dives in after this call in finishing up and getting ready to defend his PhD thesis. We're looking forward to talking to Dr. Becker in just a you know, few short months. Michael, delighted to have you with us. Hey, everybody. Thank you very much. So let's just jump in because in the immortal words of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, we have so little to do and so much time to do it in. Wait a minute. Reverse that. Uh, we've got a lot to cover and little time. But before we start, uh, Lynn uh, Wells has a hand up. Lynn, did you have a question or? Nope. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to, I had a question for, for Kevin. I'll, I'll get it the, after the bottom of the hour. Perfect. All right, just wanted to make sure you can contribute. Uh, and along that way, and with that in mind, if anybody wants to interrupt me, please do. Um, it's not a problem. And let me just go ahead and so I can actually see you. So feel free to interrupt me. Uh, Kevin, if you can monitor the chat and if questions come in, just jump in. Yeah, pause. My, let's, yeah, let's it's, it, what I'll do is I'll try to do that at certain intervals so that you know there is a certain flow uh, sure. to this. And... You know, what I would recommend folks is, well, we've got spotlight. I can't see all of you if you raise, if you use the raise hand function. So put your comments into chat and I'll call on you in order. Okay, back to you, Michael. Perfect. All right. So let's jump in. What, what I wanted to talk about today was the personal data and identity meeting of the waters, or at least what I'm, uh, I'm, I'm calling it. And this is a broad new paradigm and thoughts and ideas on how we go about achieving a new path to value throughout society. Um, so let's start out with one kind of general insight. I mean, we all, hopefully many of us are aware of the, the idea of 1984, a book written by George Orwell in 1948. And the, the premise of the book was essentially, you know, government um, and the bodies that oversee us could end up surveilling us. And, you know, um, really he painted this dystopian world of where, the, uh, where we might end up. And frankly, I think Orwell was an optimist because at the time, he really didn't consider or think about corporate surveillance and the mass uh, mass uh, levels of data that would be peripherated by uh, every actor within society. Uh, and so when we zoom back out, I mean, we're kind of sitting at this intersection right now where the individual, all of us, um, is the entree on the table. Uh, we have become the fuel that is powering modern society and I personally don't like the word consumer. I prefer the word individual because consumer is a made up term by marketers um, to uh, think about different stages of interacting with an individual across the customer journey. And you know, for me, that individual is a consumer. They're a user, they're a patient, they're a voter, they're a subscriber, they're a shopper, they're an investor, they're an employee. Um, there are also companies, um, they're also government institutions. Uh, and we, all of us are sitting at this intersection um, where if we're not careful, we're going to end up in a pretty horrific dystopian world. And I'm going to hopefully by the end of this presentation, paint a picture or at least challenge us to um, uh, slightly change direction and find a, an equilibrium state that we can uh, fall, uh, you know, strive to achieve um, to be able to create a sustainable and uh, functional society. Um, uh, kind of where we're at right now, and if we look into society, you know, we have basically from a consumer business marketing perspective, our data is being massively hoovered up. Um, so the point that we're getting these really rich, exciting, incredibly valuable services such as this, you know, your phone told your Fitbit that told your Nest that told your Sonos that you owe your wife an apology. Now that very well might be true and probably is. 
um, for a whole bunch of reasons. But who gave any of the actors within industry to be able to connect all of these things about my life, suck it up, and then be able to give me that recommendation? And again, that recommendation very well may be, um, uh, may be appropriate, but I don't recall ever consciously, intentionally, you know, agreeing to industry making these kinds of connections for me or on my behalf. Now, we sign these privacy policies, we interact with them. But the fact that, you know, circa 2010 and going beyond, you know, we've now moved beyond a causation-based society to a correlation-based society. So this idea of informed consent, and we check that you box can just on our website. With the, um, uh, okay. I'm not I'm using sorry, does the... somebody have a question? Okay. Um, we checked that box on the website, and, you know, that the industry has perceived that as being informed consent, which gives them unilateral control to do anything with our digital essence. Uh, and uh, frankly, I just, as you will see later as we go through this conversation, I just vehemently and 100% disagree with that model of, of where really how we evolved in, in industry. Uh, when we look at this thing we call data, um, Cisco circa 2013 suggested that by around this time, 2023, 24, 2025, um, the net economic value that would be produced from the flows of data within society would produce about $19 trillion in net economic value. Um, if you look at the role of identity, personal data, however you want to label uh, quite a bit of this data, you know, it has spawned and is supporting uh, many hundreds of billions of dollars uh, of different types of industries. And I'll, I'll, I'll uh, illustrate some of those in a bit. And recent research has shown us over the next um, few years, as we get, uh, you know, do and have a better job of uh, and releasing portability around personal data identity within society, that will lead to a net economic uh, increase of roughly one to 13% of nation states GDP. So in other words, once we actually start getting doing a better job at uh, effectively managing personal data and identity throughout our world's economies, uh, we're going to be witnessing you know, massive increases in the GDP uh, of nation states around the world. So in other words, this personal data thing is, is, is a really big deal. Um, and, you know, this idea of personal data as new black gold was actually, um, you know, coined by the EU commissioner uh, back in 2009 and has really carried through it. One of the challenges that we have to face, though, when we think about this is we as humans, we as individuals participating within this society, um, we need to be really careful because, uh, you know, people are nervous and, and, you know, and I've done a lot of research in this area and happily uh, uh, share some of that with you. Um, the last four years, I've been working with the Mobile Ecosystem Forum, producing um, a global study looking at people's sentiments at the intersection of personal data, identity, and trust. And the fact of the matter is the vast majority of people across nation states, 13 plus countries we've analyzed thus far this year, um, are feeling a sense of helplessness and indifference and anxiety when it comes to what's happening with the flows of their data. And that's resulting in loss of time, loss of money, not just from identity theft, but just the fact that they've got to buy software that they wouldn't necessarily want to purchase, for example. Uh, it's leading to loss of reputation. And in many cases, it is in fact leading to any number of um, types of fraud, harm, loss of, uh, loss of uh, you know, any, any number of different losses. And, you know, and to be perfectly frank, it's also leading to death. Um, you know, when our data is misused, um, there have been uh, very, uh, you know, very popular you know, uh, publicized cases, such as in TikTok leading to kids um, committing suicide, um, you know, massive data breaches uh, that have led people to committing suicide, stalker crimes. Uh, and frankly, when, when the, um, a hospital, for example, experiences a death, uh, data breach, death rates go up. So uh, on average. So there, there's just so much going on when we think about this, but sadly, when we look at um, our legal system and what, what it entails to protect ourselves in data um, and in loss of data, for example, let's say a company breaches our data, um, predominantly, and I'm giving some broad generalizations here, but predominantly the legal system only recognizes loss of money and it doesn't really consider or remunerate or cover any number of these other uh, very significant and uh, harms that befall us when we think about um, the, uh, the uh, you know, the, the loss and misappropriation and use of our data. And when I talk about us, I want to be really clear too. What is us? 
you know, us as me as a human being, us as you as as, indiv uh, as individuals, but us as also um, our enterprises, our organizations, us as also our government entities. In some respects, all of these different entities are all individuals in their own right, and we need to be uh, considering that. And we'll come to that in a minute. Um, so with that backdrop, I want to, you know, take uh, some lessons from the immortal Elastigirl's quote uh, in 2004, where Elastigirl in the movie Incredibles comes out and says, you know, you're, and when she's talking to her daughter, um, your identity is your most valuable possession, protect it. And if anything goes wrong, use your powers. And I think we all need to take a, a heed to this, uh, this quote from Elastigirl and really uh, uh, um, apply it appropriately to everything that we're doing going forward. So when we look at identity and we think about uh, you know, what we're doing with that, identity actually doesn't exist in the context of digital. I mean, we all have, you can have the metaphysical identity, who am I as a person, you know, the Descartian view, I think, therefore I am. I mean, we can, we can have massive uh, you know, academic and scholarly discussions you know, about the nature of identity. You know, we can do thought-provoking um, discussions around like just the ship of Theseus you know, if we start replacing every part of the ship, when the ship is completely replaced, is it still the same ship? I mean, we can we can have all of those discussions. But when we think about the nature of, you know, activating our identity in society, you know, it's really around the effective use of data for the process of identity management. And we're going to be talking about this more and more. But when we look at data, there's this broad scope of data. And that's what Cisco referred to as being this, this mechanism of creating this $19 trillion in net economic value. Um, within data, there are certain subsets of that data that we can call personal data, and I'll be defining a little bit more of this in, in just a minute. You know, there are other subsets of that personal data, which we'll refer to as identifiers. There's other subsets of that data, which we'll refer to as authentic data, which is basically cryptographically signed data. In today's parlance, that's often wrapped around the terminology or put alongside the words of Web3, Web5, et cetera. And then finally, you know, in the at the intersection of this authentic data management and identifier management, we've got this traditional method of what we'll call traditional identity management, which is really about the process that we in industry and society use to identify an individual, authenticate that individual when they're interacting or, or engaging with different services, verifying the authentication of that individual, and then delegating the delegating authorities. So once I actually know who you are and I've verified who you are. I can then delegate authority. You're allowed to do this on this website. You can represent the company in this way. Um, you are able to claim that social services um, um, uh, uh, program uh, from, you know, and, and interact with that social services program from the government. You know, there's, you know, you can file your taxes. There's just so many important things that we need that we in society leverage and use when we leverage this thing called identity. And so that's why it's so absolutely critically important because it does sit at the center of everything that we are within society. Now, thinking about this idea of personal data and really what is it? Um, and by the way, when I talk about data here, the difference between this lens here is data and personal data. The difference is data is all about data that's produced that can't be resolved to an individual um, uh, versus everything else, the data that can be resolved to the individual. And now I, I, I wanna define that um, just briefly. So. I'm going to take it to its nth discrete, uh, um, uh, nth end. When you talk to lawyers, lawyers will say personal data is the data that can be used to identify a natural person. And many of you, I'm sure you're all aware of the GDPR and CCPA and other regulatory models. I won't go those in detail now. But the problem with that legal definition is it really constrains us artificially, I believe, in the value that we need to produce for society. So I've kind of released some of those uh, artificial constraints we have applied. And the definition, definition I use for personal data is, data is data that's produced by and about an individual and by and about an individual's things. And the by and about, you know, the individual and the things are really important because this is all about me being able to have agency and control over myself. Um, but it's also the fact that if I'm producing this, this economic asset data, whether or not it's associated with me or not, it is, you know, fueling modern society to the extent that uh, to trillions and trillions of dollars, to which I'm actually not, you know, significantly participating in the in the in the wealth exchange of that, uh, and so that that you know, and that is very very problematic. And we can give any number of different examples um, uh, of where that plays out. Some, for example, are there's some estimates like from John Ellis that su suggests that the average connected car today. You know, circa 2019, 2018, 
will produce $40,000 of data in its average lifespan. So we bought the car, drove the car, maintained the car. Society is benefiting from something of the tune of $40,000 of data, but yet I get none of that. Um, or you can always go all the way back to the 1950s and the immortal life of Henry Ella Lacks, where her cancer, her cancer cells were stolen and then became the basis of a multi-trillion dollar cancer industry, you know, um, solving cancer problems. Uh, and it was just uh, about 10 years ago that her family was finally recognized and remunerated for the fact that her genetic profile was stolen. So there's just, you know, there's countless examples of the value of this data. And so when we think about this nature of personal data produced by and about me, let, let's dig into these, these core elements. And these definitions are instrumentally critical. The first one is this idea that I'm producing non-personal data. My car, my house, my devices are producing data. Um, I then will produce data about myself, my intention and um, my you know, other behaviors that aren't necessarily verified nor are they encrypted. So for example, my preferences and what I wanna do. As I interact with the digital society, some of that data may be used to identify me. And that data could be a single attribute or sets of attributes that are being used to identify me. And then those that, that data type is loosely considered to, uh, and labeled as an identifier in society. You know, as we start applying more, and especially in the context today, Web3, Web5, and other te tokenized capabilities, crypto cryptographic um, uh, applications of our data, um, we can start getting to what we call authentic data. And then quite a bit of this data can be con considered sensitive data. Uh, and all of this data is being produced by our browsers, browsers and our apps and our smart things and our public and uh, private monitoring systems that are out there in the world. And I'll just give you an example of one of these. So for instance, um, you know, depending on context and what's really critical about data collection is really it's about context. You know, for example, if I'm on an airline and I order a kosher meal, um, the certain EU regulations are starting to say, well, you know what? The fact that I'm ordering a kosher, kosher meal very well may be considered sensitive data because religious orientation is a, um, is, a, is a protected data class. And so therefore that, that data attribute now, the, air, the airline must treat that data attribute of my customized uh, meal order as sensitive personal data and secure it in, as such. Um, sexual orientation, religious orientation, there's just a whole other types of data that will be falling into this. So what I believe is going to happen as this model matures and, you know, as the people-centered internet and other leading uh, communities in the world really focus on helping us become human again, um, the idea of non-personal data is going to disappear and that all data will become personal data. It will either become data produced by or about the things that I own, my capital assets, or data that's produced by and about me. And at that point, I should be able to have certain levels of controls and ownership over how all of that works. Um, so we can we could spend the entire hour, 10 hours, 100 hours just on this one slide alone, and we don't have enough time for that. So I now want to kind of convert to this idea of how do we navigate everything that I've been talking about? How do we navigate the role and the use of this incredible natural resource and, and this, uh, this natural resource that can be reproduced and, 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 and reused multiple times without destruction um, within society in, 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 in a fair and equitable way. And the, the best analogy that I've ever been able to come up with is uh, leveraging the Amazon um, and the river, not the website. And, and what's, what happens down in the Amazon is you've got this natural phenomenon called the meeting of the waters. Essentially two rivers meet, the Amazon River and the Rio Negro. And when the two rivers meet, they don't actually merge. And they don't merge because they have different speeds, temperatures, and densities. And so the two rivers coexist in the same riverbed for nearly six kilometers or 3.7 miles um, until they can kind of mix back together. And I use that analogy to characterize exactly that's what's happening in industry today. We have traditional organizational, uh, you know, societal slash uh, corporate capitalistic surveillance uh, approaches to, 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 to personal data. We're either treating personal data as an economic asset owned by an enterprise or as a, a tool for social engineering. Uh, and so that's, I, I label those as the so, uh, organizational centric approach to personal data. And that's what's been going on for hundreds of years, um, both digitally, traditionally, physically, however you want to label it. Now, over the, and likewise for, you know, I've been tracking, I've got a literature review I'll show you in just a minute of about 130 years that shows that we've been evolving towards this new people eccentric approach to our data as well. That we as an individual or we as a social commons should have the right to have some agency and control of our data. 
And in around 2020, these two rivers in society met. Uh, and I can, again, we can give all the background data on that. Just trust me, that, that's around the inflection point of when these two rivers came to be, together. So we are right now at this confluence where the, is, uh, the organizational centric and people centric approaches to personal data are meeting. And much like the river, it's going to take some time, some miles in terms of years for these two approaches to either merge or one to dilute the other. And I'm going to come back to a minute on, uh, on some thoughts on, on, on where that's going to be happening and where that's going to be going. Um, in terms of the lit review, in the United States in particular, started around 1890 with Chief Justice and Warren Brandy's uh, pr uh, producing this concept that we have the right to be left alone because they realized that this idea of a camera and an audio recorder could be used to capture information about us, capture our physical likeness, capture our voice, and that information that could be produced in society and used in society, like our picture showing up in the newspaper the next day, without our intention, null use. And so that's when they created the first um, uh, legal precedence in the United States that said you had the right to be left alone, and then you know, or the right to privacy. And then in like 1946, you had a uh, gentleman by the name of Benner Bush come out of World War II, and he invent invents this concept, the mimic machine, which will be a tool that will give us control over our identity and personal information. You know, Alan Ware suggested in 1973 in preparation for the 1974 Privacy Protection Act that, you know, we should have a digital ombudsman that can represent us to the market and help us protect and control our data. But because we don't have the technology at that time, let's park that and deal with that with later. So that's kind of the wave one, internet zero uh, uh, of our internet life. Um, between 1990 and 2010, we now, this, in, this concept, the internet is born. And now we really start digging in a lot deeper from an academic and theoretical approaches. You know, Kenneth Loudon, this image up here proposes that we should have a national information exchange, a bank to enable people to control our data, much like what Ware was talking about in the 73. And then you have other concepts like Hegel and Rapor that propose this idea of a, um, uh, an infomediary, a new business layer that would emerge to represent the individual um, to this marketplace. Um, you've got Gordon Bell um, uh, from uh, Microsoft working on the My Bits project where he can collect all the information about his life and what's going on. You have the Haystack project. Um, you have um, the, the Eclipse program in early 2001, which is arguably the first personal information management solution um, ever built. Uh, and the protocols for that. And we'll define that term in just a minute. So there's a lot happening in this internet 1.0 age, but really this is all about enabling globalization and the flows of information. And then between 2010 and 2020, we enter into the next wave of this thing we call the internet. And this is where platforms start taking over and these platforms start producing APIs and these APIs start enabling the flows of the data. This is when the World Economic Forum and, and the EU are starting to su suggest that personal data is not only the new black oil, but it's a new economic class. Because it's an economic class, it may, it may need to be uh, recognized as such on the balance sheets of business. Uh, and, that, and this is really when we start to see that there's this personal information a river uh, starting to emerge, but yet it's not yet fully connected um, with the traditional organizational centric approaches to data. And this is when we just see this massive explosion of the GAFA, GAFM companies and the social dilemma and the great hack and Cambridge Analytica and just um, you know the, you know, the 2017 breach of, uh, uh, by Equifax of 60% of the United States um, uh, population's most sensitive data. We just start seeing massive benefits and don't get me wrong, there, I'm, I'm not negative on the organizational centric approach. It's providing so much value for society but it's also creating some negative externalities that, were, that are not really uh, well under control. Which then leaves us to the fourth wave in ev evolution of where we're at, which is the internet 3.0. Um, you, you might also hear it labeled as web three, web five, the tokenization age. This is where we're now applying cryptology to the story. You might also hear the term blockchain, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, all of these other crypto NFTs. I mean, there's a lot going on here which we, that we don't have time to tease apart in this call today. But suffice it to say, what this means is that we are going to start using these new, these new and emerging technologies, cryptographic technologies, um, to be able to start giving agency and control of data back to individuals and also being able to maintain and manage the, the authority um, of those that we delegate to represent us, either you know, AKS if we're an employee, uh, employer and we have an employee. Um, and that inflection point really started happening around 2020. And so one of the key insights that you see from this, uh, this kind of revolutionary map is 100 years, 20, uh, you know, uh, uh, 20 years, 10 years, five, 
You know, we are going to see more change happening in the next three to five years than has happened in the last 130 years. I have absolutely no doubt, doubt about that, and I'm thoroughly convinced on it, and we can talk about some of those details and, and, and more later. Um, when we think about this, how are we going to bring these two rivers together? And the way we're going to bring these two rivers together is by you know, understanding and being intimately aware of the undercurrents that are driving it. And again, this is not revolutionary. This is not new. Michael Porter talked about this as far back as, you know, in the 1980s with his own version of the five forces model. But we need to be looking at technology, culture, economics, aka commercial business models, et cetera, laws and regulations and the intersection of these four core pillars, um, aka politics, to understand the influences that will be driving the, the nature and evolution of where the world's going. Um, and to give you some of those kind of you know, buzzword bingo around some of these pillars, you know, cryptology, standardization, risk scoring, zero knowledge, trust, decentralization, PIMs, smart wallets on the technical side, the commercials is combating fraud, combating loss of trust on, uh, you know, compl uh, complying, not complaining. Uh, sorry, that's an interesting typo here, a little Freudian. Complaining, complying with regulations, um, individual identity management uh, on the on the commercial side. Do we really want to have a society where more, the vast majority of people on the planet feel helpless and different when it comes to their digital self? I don't think so. It's a crappy place to be. So we need to be thinking about how we manage those things. And then we also need to be realizing that our governments, our societies are looking to shift this discussion. And by 2025, over 75% of the world's population will be covered under one or more of these emerging people-centric regulations that give individuals rights to their data, to how their data is being used, um, to be able to gain a, a, a digitally uh, data a version of that data um, at, at will. And this is gonna involve quite a, quite a bit. And then the politics of all of this is the lobbying, is both consumer lobbying and corporate lobbying and what really will the rules be and who gets carved out to do what and how will we effectively really use the resources that we have available today. Um, as I talked about on the economics front, there's many multi-billions of dollar industries that are being powered and driven by uh, personal data and identity today. And unfortunately, um, you know, it, we're so much constrained because of this old, uh, you know, organizational 2.0 lens that we put to these economies. <laughs> I'm very much of the opinion, as are many thousands of others like you on this call today, that if we start unleashing this in a, in a responsible, ethical, moral, and sustainable way, you know, what we see the value of today will be even greater. And in fact, Kevin Millay from Newsweek back in um, in 2014 had suggested that, you know, the internet as we know today, when we start unleashing personal big data, I'm <clears throat> sorry, I mean data that's under the control of the individual, the, its impact on society will be greater than that on the internet. And just let that sink in. The internet as we know today, which has fundamentally transformed society completely and forever, when we give the power back to the people, will have more impact than the internet itself. And I and I, and I firmly believe that. Um, when we look at our regulatory frameworks, it's really important for us to realize and think about, there's two poles as I've just discussed already. The organizational centric poll that looks at personal data and identity and all, and, and all data as either an enterprise asset or a tool for social engineering. Um, the gross uh, uh, representations of this the U.S. model and the China model, you know, because China's got its social credit scoring system. But let's not fool ourselves. We have a social credit scoring system here as well. We call it the credit score. And we're seeing many other things happening here. When I say us, I mean the U.S. Obviously, this is an, you know, an inter inter international audience, so we need to be thinking about that. And then on the people-centric approach of sides of things, you have Europe and many states in the U.S. and many nation states around the world that consider um, personal data as a human right. So for example, the Indian Chief Justice is about a year and a half ago said that personal data is a human right. So has the UN. Um, and so this is about how do we leverage individuals to have agency about themselves? But at the same time, how do we leverage the community resource of data? How do we produce a community commons for our data to be able to effectively be used and, uh, and shared and exchanged? And so what we need to realize when we look at these different poles of our industry of our data philosophies and the way we go about regulating them and governing data in society, we, we need to realize that all four of these polls are happening in every society worldwide all at once. It's just each society chooses to have one poll be primarily dominant. Uh, and, uh, and then that really is both a regulatory lens, but also the cultural influences that drive our language. Um, on the technical side of things, and again, as I said, we could be talking to the technology for months, years um, to come. 
But there is a, a, an emerging technical piece that's critically important, and it's called the Personal Information Management System, or AKA Smart Wallet. We're starting to lean more towards the Smart Wallet or Open Wallet language. And essentially what the PIMS is, is it's a database of me. It's, the, it's a tool, it's a suite of utilities and capabilities that allow me as an individual to do data subject ac access requests, to self-surveil myself, to, for me to be able to collect data about me into a personal data store. So now I have a database of me and then I can start collecting my behaviors and my insights and all the aspects of my life, much like what Gordon Bell was looking to achieve in 1990, around 97, 98 with My Life Fits. Then on sitting on top of that data will be in several integrated and combustible microservices and applications that will allow me to be able to process and manage and use my data across all of my different channels and all of my different tools and um, be able to really in, you know, both in, you know, protect myself, privately enrich myself, and then participate actively in the exchange of my personal data. Uh, and again, this is a, 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 an evolution that has been evolving in our societies for well over 130 years, if not more. Um, so where do we stand right now when it comes to this idea of PIMS? Um, there are over 57-ish core PIMS players in the market. If you start layering the definitions and words are hard, and we all start, if we start you know, seeing the overlapping of some of these terminologies and the intent that people will have, um, you're, you're starting to eke into the more of hundreds of players that are making this possible. Um, but if we just focus on the core elements, how do we get these, this idea that there's tools and capabilities that people should be able to be able to be to have to be able to be in control of their data? Well, it's going to start first with embedded value. I'm going to be given some type of utility from a company to be able to manage and interact with my data. Uh, and that could either be for protection or exchange or, or, or service behavioral relationship. But the flip side is the company or the value that I'm getting from the provider that's giving me access to this tool is treating me by, as a self-sovereign agent of my data, which means that they recognize that my data is my asset and they are stewards of it for the period of time while they're providing me value. And in fact, that's a really critical insight that we, I can, we can go all the way back to 1964 when Theodore Levitt proposed the, in his quintessential paper, Marketing Myopathy, that businesses have to remember that they're in business to be of service of the individual, not the service being in business of buying their products. So again, fundamental shifts of going back to what we've known for decades, uh, but now we can now make, possibly make happen. Then what will start happening is as these embedded value services evolve, and as we start learning about... Um, these services, we're going to start interoperating these services. And these interoperating interoper layers will include protocols, standards, um, both uh, you know, interoperable standards, adver adversarial interoperable activities, as well as critically governance models. Uh, and then finally, once we have that in place, we'll end up with data marketplaces. And again, this is going to be evolving quickly, probably in the next 72 uh, months or, or a little bit more. Um, and where are we right now in the industry? We're right here. Um, now, I go back to what William Gibson has most, so, so, so famously said in that, you know, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. The reality is we live in a quantum field. All of this already exists. Uh, but when we put the Newtonian layer of time and physics and all of that, uh, you know, natural physics and all of that, um, it, you know, it kind of puts another layer to our view on that. So everything I'm talking about today exists right now. Its potential exists right now. It is right here, but in your context and your understanding of it, um, both personally and commercially, it may not feel as mature as, we're, uh, as what I'm, I'm suggesting it is. And in that context, it's not, but in the quantum element, it absolutely is, and it's here right now. Um, to give you some quick examples, there are tools like Pocket Geek Privacy by Assurant, which I spent four years helping build, 10 years doing and four years helping build, that can help people protect their data. You've got the BBC that just launched the BBC Together box where the BBC is giving me, the individual, the watcher of BBC shows all of my behavioral data right back to me instantaneously. Um, you have you know, things like the IATA travel pass that are you know, aggregating up credentials for me to be able to be in control of my identity and to be able to granularly share uh, my credentials. You've got things like the Jaguar um, you know, uh, smart wallet programs that are starting to look at like, how do we put a crypto smart wallet into the car 
So when the car is driving down the road and it detects a pothole, that the car can instantaneously sell that pothole data to the city. The city now can then pay me for the fact that my car discovered that pothole. And so therefore I now can use that cryptocurrency to pay for local tolls, local parking, as well as possibly a local coffee. Um, and then I'm helping the city prioritize fixing the streets. And then finally, you can start building completely end-to-end -end different industries, like what my planet's doing in the context of real estate. And these are just one of hundreds of use cases that are evolving that will make, make it possible for us to be able to have control over our identity and personal information. Um, so we're at a crossroads in, in society right now. And that yeah, we've been walking to this crossroad for decades. Um, we probably hit it right around 2020. And we now need to make a choice. Are we going to allow empathy or en entropy, sorry, to force us down the left path into this horrifically dystopian world where we have no agency and control? Or are we going to aspire to be able to take this hard right and achieve some utopia where we all have 100% agency and control? So in other words, is we, are we going to allow the organizational-centric approach to dilute the people-centric approach to the extent that it doesn't exist? Are we going to allow the people-centric approach to dilute the, uh, the organizational-centric approach to the extent that it doesn't exist? I think it ended extremes, either, si either left or right turn, um, it was horrific for society because you either ha you have this dystopian world or unsustainable chaos. We need to find some middle ground. And I, and I define that middle ground as the identity nexus. If you think about you know, the nature of the uh, three core actors in society of individuals, enterprises, and public institution. And at that intersection is this equilibrium state, which you know, and I, I refer to as the identity nexus, much like I would say, arguably, uh, like the, in the US, we'll call it the, you know, the uh, you know, acceptable inflation rate or the acceptable unemployment rate. You know, that, you know, you know, if we kind of get to that equilibrium state, we can all survive um, and, and sustain the economy, the society, however you want. Or it's like a biosphere, uh, if, if, if you think at some equilibrium state where the biosphere can be self-sustaining over time. We need to find that state. Today, the balance, the, uh, the identity nexus doesn't exist. The vast majority of our data, identity, everything that we've been talking about is well into the hands of, of corporations and, and, public, and public enterprise. We need to bring that state back. And so I believe what's going to end up happening is whoever solves this formula, the risk, the value to risk reward ratio between individuals, enterprises, public institutions, plus the net value of the social good and negative externalities of the use of data within society, um, whoever solves this formula is going to win a Nobel Prize. Um, very analogous to what Oliver Williamson did with transactional cost theory in the 1970s. And I didn't put it on this particular slide, but Eleanor Osterman, who won the Nobel Prize for the Community Commons, um, she now has a group um, called the, um, the Eleanor Osterman Institute over at Indiana University, who is now pivoting to um, looking at the community commons of data. Uh, and, and so therefore, you know, we have two precedences of Nobel Prize winning minds that have led us to this ability to understand that finding this equilibrium state is absolutely instrumentally important for us uh, in aggregate in society. But, okay, that's the background. Uh, what do we do about all of this? Um, you know, at an individual level, I, I think what we need to do is follow what I call the five-fold path of digital sovereignty. Well, I, you know, and when I say, fit, you know, excuse me, digital sovereignty, and what I mean by that is we are digital beings. We are both physical and digital beings today. And in fact, in many contexts, our digital self has more economic value and power in society than our physical self. As a, as a white collar worker in today's digital economy, if I don't have a curated LinkedIn profile, I'm not getting a job. You know, so because that's the first place that prospective employers go. Um, it, you know, so whether or not I agree to LinkedIn's terms of service or not, doesn't matter. You know, I've got to have that profile. So we need to be thinking about how do we navigate and manage this digital world? Well, so the first step of being digitally sovereign is to be aware of what's going on. The second step is to change your behavior. If that email or text comes in and it feels fishy, it probably is, don't click on the link. When that person calls you up and says, hey, you know, you got to give me your credit card, your phone number, your password, hang up, you know, start changing your behaviors. Um, start thinking about adopting insurances and professional services to get help in the context when you need it. Start enacting your digital rights. Become a, um, you, know, you know, take back your control. 
uh, and, and interact with uh, your, your local governments, your policies, your businesses, both industry best practices as well as commercial best practices. Um, start adopting active and uh, passive technologies like a password manager, tracker manager, um, you, know, a, a, you know, identity aliasing tools such as email aliasing, phone number aliasing, address aliasing, um, IP address aliasing, et cetera. Um, start looking for and adopting smart wallets and PIM services as soon as they come out. Uh, and then as um, they say in Buddhism, you know, the way to re achieve enlightenment is through, through active participation with the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, with the teacher, the teachings, and the community. You know, find your community like the one you have here. You can constantly educate yourself. And in this process, you will, you will be able to achieve um, digital sovereignty. From an industry perspective, what do we need to do? Well, there's two halves. On the organizational side of things, on the short term, it's about enacting organizational identity, namely, you know, protect individuals from bad industry actors, being more efficient and profitable with data and reestablish trust. Um, and organizational identity is all about this idea of not only let's not just resolve that we can understand, you know, we can identify the individual, we need to be able to cryptographically identify an organization and the representatives of that organization, the humans, the bots, the APIs, uh, the messages that may have interactive elements into it that are um, been given delegated authority by that organization. We need to, as individuals, receivers of an originating engagement from an organization to be able to cryptographically verify instantaneously that that, that company is real, that that company has the right to communicate with me through that channel, that the campaign, that campaign or communication we're doing with me is trustworthy. And once we have that, we then can start building, rebuilding trust and having faith. Um, this, this concept of organizational identity is brand new and it's launching into the market uh, in about six weeks. And I'll be talking about that in just about 90 seconds. Um, on the other side, we need to be doing personal data identity. We need to protect industry from bad, bad individual actors, from individual fraudsters, from individuals that go into the store and intentionally buy a product wear it to the prom, and then turn it back, return it back two days later. You know, that's one example. Or just consciously and purposely conduct fraud um, and or bad actors that are smishing or phishing a SIM card uh, in order to be able to drain somebody's bank account, um, you know, which ultimately doesn't it affects the individual to an extent, but really affects the credit card company or the bank because of the uh, insurance processes. So we need to be leveraging these different activities short term. And there's a whole host of technologies, tools, and services to be able to do that. Um, and then long-term, we need to focus on creating digital humanity. Uh, uh, humanity. How do we build sustainable per personal data, data ecosystems that we all can participate to achieve this identity nexus as we talked about? We also need to realize that in context of all of this, there will be a new cryptographic business metric that's going to evolve. You know, as a, you know, say a prospective advertiser to a publisher, I don't care how many email addresses you have. I don't care how many uh, phone numbers you have in your database. What I care about is how many cryptographically verifiable connections you have with an individual or sets of individuals. So when I opt in as an individual in this new oral world order, powered by organizational and personal data identity in the Web3 context, what that means is I don't opt in and give you my email address. What that means is I opt in with my private, with my public key saying that it's okay that you can interact with me. And now that, that, that opt in is cryptographically verifiable. And at any time, if I disagree with the way you're interacting with me, I'll cut you off and 100% of me goes dark. And so this is going to become the future business metric, both for industry and for individuals, and that we need to be preparing for that. And we don't have time to go into that in too much detail today. Um, so frankly, what do we need to do and how do we move forward on this? We need to shift our awareness. We need to strive for education. We need to drive solutions and we need to collaborate. We need This is going to take a village. It's going to take all of us to stitch these five you know, undercurrents of the two primary rivers that they're coming together. Um, and I'll leave you with this, you know, the, uh, Darwin suggests it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but those that are most responsive to change. So the only constant that you're going to have going forward in the chain is change. And that change is going to be exponentially happening in the next three to five years. If you want to learn more about this, by the way, I've been spending um, uh, ample time over the last two months uh, preparing for the MEF Connects ID and Auth Personal Data and Identity Working Group. This, at this event, we'll be launching the concept of organizational identity for the first time in society. We've got the head of the G20's um, GLIF organization um, giving keynotes. We've got the UK government representing. Um, we've got um, just you know the, the leaders that are making this capability possible 
happening right now. Next week, um, just starting Tuesday in the Mountain View, if any of you are here in the Bay Area, we also have the Internet Identity Workshop happening, um, which is a, uh, you know, the place that has birthed many of these technologies uh, that enable us to have agency and control of our data. This is a free event. You can attend in person and or if you're in the London area, you can attend in person. If you're not, register and then you can stream it online. Um, but you know everything I've been talking about is going to be talked in depth at this event, um, and it's just going to be wickedly awesome. I just I, I really really can't wait. Um, so with that in mind, thank you very much. I think we have a few minutes left for uh, questions, answers, um, and uh, observations. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Greatly appreciate that. it. And uh, we have uh, both our regular Q and A, and we have um, overtime right between uh, twelve thirty Eastern and, and one o'clock. So um, let's start with uh, Ron Suarez. Ron, you posted several things in uh, in chat, and then um, I'll call on uh, Frank Odat and then uh, Mark Prinsky. So. Uh, Ron, are you there? Okay, yes. Um, so in addition to uh, Broadband.Institute, I'm the Director of Digital Equity for Latinx uh, Digital Leaders Now in, in Chicago. And I'm, uh, per, first, thank you for a great presentation, Michael. I, I learned a lot uh, 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 listening to it. Uh, and uh, uh, I see over and over again, as these various problems are presented, and I've founded four software companies and have been uh, in the corporate world teaching advanced technology. And there's a limit to how much change you can get from talking to uh, individual people. And I like the idea of a commons. Um, I'm not using it, but I have the phone number, DAO, Distributor Autonomous Organization Commons, that I bought from Twilio. Um, uh, and uh, so my question is, uh, how much do we put on the individual, here's the things you need to do, versus how do we establish a commons uh, so that we don't have to rely on each individual learning yeah. these things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that's a really great question. And if you go back to my slides, it's got to be a balance, right? So if you look at the research and the research I've been doing lately, most people are so tired and so exhausted and so overwhelmed, they don't want to do anything and they just want to defer to the government or enterprises and have, you know, say, government, you take care of it and protect me because that's what I pay my taxes for. And enterprises just do the freaking right thing. You know, be honorable and have faith in that. The problem, though, is um, that just that in the, as we've learned in Internet 1.0 and Internet 2.0, it doesn't work. You know, government can't government can't scale and hold enterprises accountable. They can't be the ombudsman, which is the role that they have in society right now, just because there's too many things going on. And um, in the end of the day, in the capitalistic model, we can't trust it. Um, the model will ultimately defer to the lowest common denominator, which is make money, which has driven us into this, this path. You know, and I'm, doing, I'm saying that statement grossly and at its extremes. It's not the case everywhere. Um, so when we enter into the web 3.0, what's going to start happening is in pockets, and this will evolve over time, we're going to start cryptographically signing all data. And if we're not careful, every data pack on the internet is going to get si assigned by the key to whoever created it, at which point all data gets locked down. So that's also problematic because then that would hurt the social commons side of things. So when we think about it, and, there, and the UK government uh, and Mark Rushton and his team over the DCIS is doing some amazing work looking about how do we actually enable these intermediaries? How do we leverage the PIMS technology into any number of six different commercial models that in aggregate make the community commons thing happen? Some of those models are data trust, data cooperatives, data unions. There's different commercial models that are being considered. Um, and there will be varying in context by country and region by regulatory models. So it's a very difficult question to answer, um, uh, but we're 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 slowly but surely inching our way there. Um, and it's 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 things like we're doing today that's going to get us there. But at the end of the day, I just want to leave us with this: we are all accountable for ourselves, right? You have to be accountable for yourself. And I think so many people have just given up and don't want to be accountable for themselves. They don't want to learn. They want to fall back into the horrific three C's, which is what's driven us to the 
dystopian world that we're driving ourselves down to, which is comfort, conformity, and convenience, right? If you want to change and if you want to grow, you have to get uncomfortable and move beyond the three C's and hold yourself accountable and see yourself for what's going on. And then- uh, I'll let I'll ask comment. I have, I have the four C's, cooperative, collaborative, community commons. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. So maybe let's, I, I dropped my LinkedIn uh, um, in the chat. Let's connect afterwards and- Great, love to great. With you. So Michael, would you also put the link to the conference information into chat when you have an opportunity? Sure. That would be great. And uh, before we go to the next question, just a moment, Frank, I'm going to ask um, Lynn Wells to join us because he has a, a community announcement. He's a member of the uh, Guests and Speakers Committee. Lynn, glad to have you uh, joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. I just wanted to talk about uh, Star Tides for a minute. And the Star Tides is our annual uh Capabilities demonstration that takes place uh, Monday through Wednesday of, uh, in this case, the uh, this week in April, uh, at, at George Mason University in Fairfax, and then uh, uh, Thursday and Friday are in Pentagon Center Court. Uh, the idea is to show how, sort of in the field or soon to be fielded, the commercial technologies can apply to areas like building resilient communities, domestic and foreign disaster relief, and support to human security, freedom from war and freedom from fear. Uh, also the intersection with uh, between civilian and DOD technologies. In any case, uh, Star Tides kicks off tomorrow afternoon at uh, four o'clock Eastern with a panel uh, on sustainable resilience in the face of climate change. Uh, that'll be uh, moderated by the Craig Fugate. And we'll have representatives from uh, interior, defense, uh, commerce. Uh, then, uh, the next uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, there'll be a series of exhibits uh, across the seven infrastructures of Star Tides, which is uh, power, shelter, water, food, comms, uh, public health, and uh, mobility, and um, mobility and uh, basically uh, logistics. In addition, there'll be another seven panels, which will deal with things like the extraordinary set of oppor opportunities coming up from Puerto Rico, uh, with uh, the uh, energy, uh, be another on ethics uh, in uh, uh, developing resilience to climate change, uh, others on building community resilience, so on and so forth. I'll send a, um, uh, a note to the community on, these, on the schedule. These will all be broadcast uh, and we'll have, uh, we won't know the link uh, per se until tomorrow when it gets uh, set up with the university. But anyway, the, they will be broadcast. Uh, over Tuesday, Monday night, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and we uh, I'll circulate that link to all of uh, the PCI community. If any of you were in Northern Virginia, I'd encourage you to come by. Uh, it'll be open, uh, the field will be open from basically 9.30 until uh, 5 on Tuesday, and from 9.30 until 3 on Wednesday. So, thank you very much, and really hope to see you all at uh, our 16th uh, annual Star Tides event. Thanks, Lynn. We, gr we greatly appreciate you sharing that with us and making you uh, us aware that uh, Star Tides is about to kick off. And I know you put in a lot of effort, so um, I'm sure you're looking forward to Thursday, right, when you can take a breath. Well, no, Thursday and Friday we're at the Pentagon. Different set oh, okay. of different set of issues. <laughs> we, 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 okay, we are greatly Saturday. looking forward to Saturday when we head off to New York for the Forest Club annual dinner and just wait to get to veg out and eat there you go. scorpions and, and the tarantulas. Thank you, sir. All right, Thanks. so back to uh, Michael uh, and, uh, and questions. Uh, Frank, you're next. Uh, a lot of information very fast, Michael. I like that pace. It keeps my attention. Uh, years ago, I wrote a an article for the uh, historic mining community, Butte, Montana, uh, richest hill in, the, in human history, uh, the new gold rush, that with internet, the value of people can uh, redo the economy. Vince uh, published a recent book, The People-Centered Work Economy. And uh, you know how you take a regular person and get them to where they can handle a, a PC and all the tools at the pace that they're changing and moving forward has always fascinated me. Uh, I ran across an AI program yesterday that says uh, for 16 bucks, you can do voice or 
yeah, voice to ebook publishing. And I've been unable to post that to, uh, to the PCI because I think there's a link in there and it's spam. So is it a way to get me to click on a link or is it real? But the idea is very, very compelling. So, 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 so let me interrupt you on that real quick. Yeah. Up until now, up until 2020, our general modus operandi, 2010 actually, but 2020, general modus operandi has been trust but verify, right? I think Reagan might have said that. I can't remember who could coin that term. I think, I think that's forward, right. I think going forward, it must, we need to flip it. It's detrust, distrust, and then verify, right? We need to assume something is fake and wrong. And then leverage our tools, our either our active or passive or automatical tools, to help us resolve whether or not something is in fact authentic, and has the authority to represent. And that's where organizational and personal data identity models and what my whole event in May is going to be talking about is how do we do that. So we we need to fl flip the script, and, it, and it's so against our human nature because we want to trust. We're naturally trusters, um, but in the digital world, we just can't do that anymore. Well, Jack Park posted uh, the decline in American values uh, to the PCI recently, and I read it, and uh, it looks like we're falling apart as far as American values. Uh, we're split down the middle as far as do we believe people are basically good or not. So how to reestablish trust and identity, we send uh, responses to the FCC RFCs uh, to uh, the FCC in competition with 22 million bot responses. I don't think my voice is getting through. But, uh, you know, on that, uh, in this uh, very blue collar town of Butte, we've had internet two for two decades. And many senators have been embarrassed that it didn't cause any impact at all. Uh, what, what fascinates me is what you said, Michael, is true. This, something's happening all at once. Uh, all of a sudden, everybody's the top down are having listening sessions, begging the grassroots stakeholders to tell them how to pull this off, create trust, involve everyone. We'll get them. And the, the government, our government is getting fast internet to people who have no idea what the real benefits are or the real risks of broadband. And that's always been my take is let's uh, communicate in simple terms. The heck with complexity theory. I'm in for simplicity and clarity theory, so regular people can get an honest shake on on what's really possible. And, Frank, uh, do you have a question? All right, I'm sorry. Uh, do you have a question for Michael? Yeah, you, how do we, you're, you've how got do some we opinions, create, but I want to know if you have a question for how him. do we create trusted outcomes uh, for? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the answer is adopt organizational identity and personal data and identity, give cryptographic keys to the creator of data. And then once we know that, we then can have, at least for now, we can have certainty to know who we're dealing with. You're dealing, I'm dealing with you, the company, or you, the government. You're dealing with me, this human individual, or bot or machine. Then we allow time to play itself out. How reputation is built, how trust is built over, over is built over repeated interactions where we both allow each other to be vulnerable. And when someone screws up, someone is honorable and fixes the problem in a timely manner that works. And over that time, that's how you build reputation. That's how you build trust. And we can only do that uh, at scale in the digital world if we can hold, e hold each other cryptographically responsible. Um, now, this used to work 100 plus years ago when we all lived in the village. I woke up in the morning, you interacted with me, you were a jerk today, I'm a jerk tomorrow, the third day we make up. That happens repeatedly over time. We build a community. And the internet, we don't have the ability to hold each other accountable. So the way we're going to do that is with these emerging cryptographic technologies. And that, and so at the end of the day, what Web3, what Web5 is really about is building, is rebuilding community, building the internet we should have built in the first place. Because if you remember, when we built the internet, we forgot something critically important. The original internet did not, did not have an identity layer. So we are now putting an identity layer onto the, onto the original internet. So web, web three is not one incremental change from web two. That's why Dorsey calls it web five. It's an isoclontic shift as defined by Scully, not just a simple paradigm shift. And we need to understand that in all of its entirety. And then all of the ramifications and implications that will come out of that. Okay. Very so good. How, 
So how do uninformed stakeholders inform the United Nations and the US government as to how to reverse the uh, economy to focus on the value of people? That would be my question. And I think you and Dr. Ron have kind of alluded to solutions emerging, uh, but I, I find- Well, 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 well we're gonna do it in pockets and we're gonna do it in specific domains. And over time that will aggregate up. Um, we also need to, you know, we, again, I think the other thing is we need to be holding ourselves accountable, right? Let's not look to someone else to solve the problem, right? We all, every one of us need to break our, 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 our stranglehold on the three C's of conformance, convenience, and, and um, comfort and get a little bit uncomfortable and solve this problem because the tsunami alarm went off 130 years ago. The digital tsunami is now washing over the shores of every economy worldwide. And the topology of the landscape of our societies, not just our econ economies, are forever different. And we, and we don't want to admit that because we want to be comfortable, we want it to be convenient, and we want to conform because that's the easier way. That's the easier path. Guess what, guys? We don't achieve digital enlightenment. We don't achieve any form of enlightenment through the lens of the three Cs. We've got to get uncomfortable both as individuals, as community groups, and as so much. The other thing is, let's not be left or right zealots. We, you know, let's not focus on the agency of the, the, it's all about sovereignty of the individual to an extent. It's all about corporations being able to, or enterprise governments to be able to socially engineer or own an asset. To an extent, we need to find the equilibrium straight in the middle ground, right? Because we're not going to have a functional society or functional economies without meeting in the middle. It's just not going to happen. It won't be sustainable otherwise. And I so think what it's going to take I think what you're time. saying is proof of concept pockets are imminent. And that's what no, the they're not just imminent. They are happening to. right now. Citizen Me is launching three incredible services in healthcare, commerce, and advertising in three weeks, right? As one of the major examples. You've got the entire country of Flanders that is standardizing on giving people credentials. You've got all of Europe that's putting the EIDA standard in place right now. Right. So get involved. So, the biggest challenge so, I have, and so let me just finish on this. The biggest challenge I have is we all want the easy, I will pay you if you can guarantee and guarantee me executable income on the other end. The challenge is we forgot that thinking that you know planning takes effort. So people like me, it's incredibly difficult for us to get people to pay us to actually do the work that needs to get done to make a difference, right? Because society wants the answer. I'll, I'll pay you a dollar if you guarantee me a dollar uh, 25 back. Somehow along the way, we've lost the idea that we need to invest in our Mike, thinking. Uh, so we and need to, uh, and Mike is open. You're, you're, so uh, I just want to say that uh, the first hour we have no, you told me it was concluded me. and uh, that was before. We'll thank Michael Becker for being with us. We're going to go into overtime and questions in just a moment. Uh, really fascinating. Uh, and I'll, I'll agree that a lot of information was uh, presented in a very short period of time. Well done. Uh, for those of you who want to stay for overtime, we're delighted to have you with us. Uh, the next person who's up for um, question is Mark Prinsky. Mark? Hi, everybody. Hi, Michael. Uh, thanks for your presentation. You, you cited Michael Porter, and you reminded me of when I was in, at Harvard 50 years ago when Michael Porter was there. And, and he is an incredible overcomplicator of everything. And, and so what occurs to me is that it's what I learned there. It's all about wealth. And everything that you said about, about identity is really about wealth. Ownership is money. Possession is money. And how we're going to distribute that wealth is a human question that has long preceded the internet and the technology which we just built like we build a human society. Actually, can I, yeah, great, can I jump in before you ask a question? It's not all about wealth. It's perceived as being all about wealth. It's all about value. It doesn't have to be about money. It can be about efficiency. It could be about better farming. It could be about improved uh, transportation. And in fact, there's a wonderful book you should all read by David Fleming called Lean Logic that talks about yeah, the fact I agree that with our, you. 
Yeah, if, I can, if I can pursue this just a little yeah, bit, I agree with you that it doesn't, it doesn't have to be about money, but it is about money. And that's the way that's human just, society just, has evolved. And that's the, and, and the ultimate question underneath that we're not asking is whether we should be about this, because there's always the tension between the individual who wants to be wealthier and the society. And that's a tension that we are only perpetuating and not addressing. And I don't think that this idea of, of um, uh, individual identity is going to help us in that way. Uh, uh, let me, okay, I've got I've gotten uh, several yeah, thoughts on that. Uh, and we don't really have the forum to really counter back back and forth on that. But I think it's about value, not just about wealth. Somebody's mic is on. I think it's about, I think it's Brian. I think about the... Um, you know, if I think about, you know, we, we think about Maslow hierarchy, if part of the U.S. model, or I'll call it the Western mindset, is we think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And at the top of the, the top of the pyramid is, you know, self-actualization. And I think in so much we have over, to your point, overcomplicated, we've overvalued the individual to, an, to, to a massive extent. And in fact, the history says Maslow, when he was coming up with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, actually spent a tremendous amount of time at the, um, at the uh, Indian uh, Blackfoot Nation. And he actually riffed his model from the Indian Blackfoot Nation. And for them, the individual is not at the top. The, it's about creating community actualization is really the ultimate pinnacle. And self-sustaining of community is the ultimate pinnacle. So I think there's going to be some balances between the individual and and the community actualization. And I think learning from what, again, David Fleming, unfortunately, it passed away right when he finished this book. Uh, but his point being in this book is we built all of our modern based business, uh, all of our modern based economies, and you're right, on wealth, on this idea of forever growth, right? If you look at the way we measure success in business, the way we measure in success in life, my GDP goes up. If it doesn't go up, I failed. My income goes up. If it doesn't go up, I failed. Um, and we basically built our whole model on exponential, constant, increasing growth. And what David Fleming does is he challenges that and says, at some point, we run out of resources for constant growth. And so therefore, when that happens, how do you do it? You got to manage the decline. And so that is very much along the line of Asimov's foundation series too. We know at some point, we're going to run into some pretty significant problems. Let's pl let's apply some Asimovian math or uh, you know Henry Selden esque math to be able to get us from fifty thousand years of pain to ten thousand. But we're going to need to go through some pain to get there. Uh, and um, I think there's some there's a lot there's a lot to unpack what I just said there. But there's, there's thank you. Important My topic. reaction to that just I'm going to end right here. <laughs> My reaction to that is we think about forever growth for some. And that's where it comes down. That's the big totally difference agree. is that we, we just narrow this pile down to, you know, wealthy Americans or Europeans or whatever it is who have advantages. And we leave out three quarters of humanity from all of this stuff. Yeah. And we run, we run a tremendous amount of risks because right now we're digitizing, um, we're digitizing identities. We're digitizing currency. We're putting kill switches in every car. And who's going to control that? I mean, there, there, you know, I don't want to go all queuing on here, but there's some pretty scary stuff that's happening in the world. Yeah. And we are uh, thinking about the, um, the, 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 the future 2020, 30 projects, the 15 minute city, again, tremendous amount of opportunity for social positivity there. But unless we as communities find that balance, we're going to be uh, causing quite a bit of pr trouble for ourselves. Yeah. I'm, I'm reminded that recently they were talking about the next uh, characteristic of a self-driving car is that the um, company will be able to repossess it automatically, that it will drive itself to the lot. Yeah. Right? <laughs> well, you know, and, and in fact, um, uh, Caterpillar, um, the tractor company is doing just that. They had a bunch of tractors that got stolen in Ukraine by the Russians and they went and those all of those tractors were brought into, in, into Russia and Tractor reached out through the internet and bricked them all. There you go. Right. And so who gets to own that? And <laughs> really, and, how, and, and in fact, the new, um, there's some arguments that the new uh, Infrastructure Act that we just put in the United States, buried within that is this idea 
that we have the ability to shut down a car if we think that somebody's drunk driving, yeah. right? And, and and like, where where do we start drawing those lines? I mean, again, I, I, I think one of the challenges that we have when we have with these discussions, it's not the left or the right. We've got to find that middle, that middle sure. equilibrium state. It's just, it's, it's critical. So next is David. David, we're delighted to have you with us. Your question. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks a lot, Michael. Really insightful uh, presentation, and I appreciate your um, telling us over and over that we need to be looking for this middle ground. I have a question, and actually, I'm going to be a, a, make the assumption that there's some way of uniquifying identities, and uh, basically, people and bots can't create a whole set of fake identities as they do in today's web. And then assuming that that's the case, what are some of the ways that this will happen? And uh, what are the implications for scams, abuse, and false information? In yeah, future? yeah, no, that's really, really good. And that's where I encourage you to attend our event on May 25th, virtually, if you can't make it to London in person. Um, okay. In that... Um, how is it going to happen? Well, so how is it happening now? So in the context of like marketing and average, and again, it's happening in pockets. So in the context of like marketing and advertising, um, there are programs like the campaign registry. You've got entities like Aegis Mobile. You have the sender ID initiatives that are all be that are all starting to put in methods that say we're verifying you as an organization automatically. We're verifying that you have rights to send traffic over this number through those carriers. The carriers, for example, are instilling, you know, um, you know, spam moderating, moderating activities. Uh, but the problem, though, is one of um, access and accessibility, right? Or excuse me, uh, accessibility and accuracy is the spectrum, right? So you can either have a system be easy and accessible, <laughs> or you can have it be accurate. And the problem that we're facing with right today is we all want easy and accessible. So if you're going to automatically scan my identity and verify who I am, and you're going to do that in one one hundredth of a millisecond, well, guess what? A lot of crap's going to fall through the cracks. Right. Right. But if you do it with 100% accuracy, it's going to take time and money. Right. And we don't necessarily have that. And so um, the G20 at the, at the fall of the banking collapse in the U.S. or globally in 28. Um, uh, 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 G20 being the group that the 20, the, the global 20 companies that are managing our, 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 our world finances, um, established Glyph as an organization to put that super accurate verification of a company play, uh, in play. Uh, and they've been giving these verified credentials to companies. They've done about 2 million in 20 years. Um, and then you've got companies like Aegis who've done like 1.2 million in the last 18 months. Uh, of verifications of entities and implementing this organizational identity concept. So the reality is these pieces are in play. They are coming together. Um, and um, over time, really where we're at is we're at that late stage of the, uh, of the bubbling primordial soup where some of the little thing beasties are crawling out of the soup. Some have legs, some have wings. Some that have wings can actually fly some that have wings can't fly at all. Some have, you know, some have legs that can run. Some can uh, can crawl. Some of them have legs and wings, but really all they can do is roll over. You can scratch their belly and they can giggle um, because they're not really doing anything and it's kind of vaporware. Um, and so that's really where we're at. And what we need to realize is how do we get some of the wing, some with the legs and some of the wings to actually cohabitate and then evolve. Um, and so we're at that really early primordial soupish stage uh, of making these things that I've been talking about happen. But what's different, and I'll use this analogy, if we think about the primordial soup of social media in 2007, the things that impeded the social media movement, no, no broadband internet, uh, very little smartphone adoption, uh, 3G networks, uh, mobile networks, no e-commerce acceptance, uh, and you know, very little regulation, all of those impediments are now gone. And in fact, the accelerators have moved from, you know, from you know, headwinds to tailwinds. And <laughs> so what took Facebook um, basically 12 years to get 60% of the global population to be doing social media is going to happen this time in five to six because impediments are gone and tailwinds are accelerating. This is the global warming of data. 
And like global warming, <laughs> what ends up happening is you get massive extremes that are going to be wildly good and at the same time, wildly bad. And that's, and that's where we're happening right now. And we're going to see massive acceleration of change. And we all just need to strap in and get ready. Thank you. Okay. So next up, Ben Kosinski. Ben? <clears throat> Hi, thank thank you very much, Mike. I, I was I've made a number of comments uh, during the stream, and we could see if uh, any of of them are relevant and worthy of discourse. But I, I wanted I raised the point initially about there's a natural tension. We can't assume that that the individual rights dominate, and uh, societal societal rights, whether they're rendered via the uh, commerce elements or social elements or whether they're rendered by governmental elements have to be taken in balance so how do we get and start with first principles instead of instantiation that we tend to do by building case law and tread through be these these we cannot survive at with case law at a uh, development and evolution here. We've got to start with first principles that that um, render and recognize the real and perceived rights, not just the asserted rights of of the individual, of society, of government, and of quote commerce per se as a part of society. Yeah, no, th those are all really great observations. And what I what, as I've thought about this quite a bit, and I I, I really struggle with it, and. For me, you know, uh, you know, the, you know, and I and I've already referred to some Buddha, Buddhist uh, Buddhist esque analogies, and I'll, I'll use this one. So when the when the Buddha gave his first teaching, it was called the Four Noble Truths, and uh, we won't go into a whole treatise around that. But in the end, he said, you know, we need to, you know, in order to achieve enlightenment, you need to follow the Eightfold Path, and you know, we translated that from Sanskrit into English, and we say right thinking, right thought, right such. And the problem is, is the word right, the, the Sanskrit word translates to the concept of right, but right, it's really more, a, a really more appropriate, uh, what's really more of the better translation is appropriateness. What is the appropriate speech? What is the appropriate um, uh, work? What is the appropriate amount of effort? And the appropriateness is critical because what we need to accept and understand is context. And I think one of the most important things that we're going to be needing to do in today's digital world, and we, when we start doing this geospatial uses of data, is to make sure that we're appropriately using, utilizing this data within context. And some of that context is, for example, the culture to which uh, a country has chosen to uh, evolve into. You know, so U.S. is very individualistic culture. You know, uh, Coco, sorry about the, 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 I'm not an African expert, but I understand that many of the African nations are more cultural, culturalistic, um, you know, are community oriented. You know, the Indian nations are more community oriented. And it's very easy for us to be, you know, and one of the challenges we're having from a regulatory perspective, and one of our good friends, and actually one of these communities um, uh, advisors is Justin Bryant. And he taught me this concept of um, the transplant effect of regulations. And one of the things that his research had shown is that you know many you know African nations are adopting the GDPR in mass because they want to do business with Europe, but they're essentially now adopting individualistic centric regulatory models into community centric culturalistic sense. Uh, sorry, the word's not coming out right. Uh, environments, and it's much like dropping an organ into a body that is not prepared to you know, to do that. And so you end up that you know, essentially the, the community will end up over time rejecting those regulations, rejecting that individual mindset because it's not oriented to it. And that could cause as many problems, if not, you know, as, as much as many problems as, as, as there is good. So we really need to take this kind of more holistic, balanced approach. And we also need to realize there's power in words and that the same word can mean different things. You know, um, uh, when you were interacting with people, especially when I interact with the, um, you know, the British quite often, I'll be, you know, coming from a very California, Northern California centric use of a term. And then I'm dealing with somebody over in the UK who <laughs> is also presumably speaking English. We're using the same word and they mean totally different things. You know, and so I think that's the other thing that we need to be unteasing is how do we create this Rosetta Stone of data, which we can in fact do 
and then be be able to be recyclable for culture. And it's gonna take and it's gonna take time. And, and, uh, then, and it's gonna take effort. Um, but the, I that notion of, that of the notion of context is not uh, universal to the uh, nexus of core stakeholders of the it's individual not. society and um, and also it's present and future you have uh, you have native tribes who uh, have as a part of every decision process seven generations forward implication right. well, so that I have a, a time horizon on every decision too that that's embedded in in it as well, well and and so the the context really is very important uh, in um, in any kind of governance and implementation, not, and and it's yes. certainly well beyond just our uh, traditional taxonomy. Yes, and and I think one thing we also have to be very 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 careful with is that you know, and it was for me I learned this in the in the uh, in the documentary terms and conditions back around 20, 29, 2010, in that uh, I think the term they used or I've interpreted it as retroactive retribution you know what was okay to, in today's context may not be okay 10 years from now 20 yeah. years from now right yeah. what's okay when i'm out you know you know, uh, you know um there was a in the, in the or even immediately so for example in the movie there was a british citizen who texted i'm gonna go blow up america flies into la and gets retained by the fd F, uh, fbi it's right around 20 2011 when it happened gets retained by the FBI when he lands because they literally interpret it as I'm going to go blow up America. And it, what he was meaning is I'm going to fly to America and then go on a bender for a week and get drunk and party my butt off. And that, and, and so there was immediate for him, immediate retroactive retribution in the lack of understanding of context. And if you then fast forward 30 years and all of that, and the movie, The Circle really, uh, uh, in the book, more importantly, you know, epitomizes this, where what your, our forefathers did could then impact us today socially and socially uh, um, and, 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 uh, and community wise. And so there, there's just massive amounts of things that we need to be more sensitive of when we consider the topics we're talking about today. Okay. So we lost Brian, which was our last question. So uh, evidently we got uh, too close to the top of the hour for he, what he needed to do. Uh, Michael, um, thank you very much. I'd like to ask you to uh, offer any summary thoughts, and then we're going to uh, close this call. It was a very stimulating one, and we greatly appreciate you being with us. Yeah, I guess my summary thoughts is, is there is a tremendous amount happening. Uh, going back to the tsunami analogy, it's been happening for over 100 years. It's been happening for decades. It's been happening for society. Um, but the change that we're going to experience, more change is going to happen in the next five years than has in the last hundred. Social change, technological change, regulatory change, um, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, commercial change, um, political change. And we need to get ready for it. And we need to not look to others to protect us and take care of it. Each of us individually also need to hold ourselves individually accountable to doing this uh, and actively participate in finding and helping solve the identity next equation so that we can create an equilibrium state, both for our local uh, areas, our regional areas, our federal areas, and frankly, from the entire globe. So thank you again for, uh, for being with us. We wish you well uh, as you navigate the conferences that are coming up and your keynotes. And as I said at the top of, of this call, uh, the successful landing of your uh, PhD and thesis. Yeah, no, thank, right. thank you very much. And if anybody else is out there and wants me to get involved with what they're working on, please reach out. Please do LinkedIn link in with me. Um, and I'd love to be connected. I hope that you make your uh, thesis publicly available. Uh, I'll raise my hand and say that at least there, there's one person who would like to read it beyond your advisors. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate it. All the best. It. Thanks, everyone, All right. for joining. Right, bye -bye. Cheers. Bye -bye.